Kumba Malga and Kumba Dani Gyanindu, Yurigiri State Library of Queensland Koo, which is good evening. It's good to see you and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland. In Baragam, which is the traditional language of the community that, grew, that I grew up on the Darling Downs. And good evening, everyone. I'm Vicky McDonald, and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland, your State Library. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you here to this evening. I begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd like to um, welcome and acknowledge tonight's special guest, Dr Fiona Foley. Also um, in conversation with Fiona tonight, Associate Professor Sandra Phillips. And Sandra is a member of the Library Board of Queensland and also the Chair of the State Library's um, Indigenous Advisory Group. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Rachel Captain West, who is the 2021 Monica Clare Research Fellow. So welcome to you, Rachel. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, it's certainly fantastic to see you here this evening and be able to have such an event such as what we're having tonight. State Library is committed to truth-telling, and we understand the history books of the past have privileged one view, one version of the world, and we know that that must change. The unabridged story of Queensland must be told widely and with respect. As a trusted global institution, our collections need to tell the whole truth. We work hard to ensure our collections, exhibitions and programs include once excluded perspectives especially those of First Nations people. State Library's Monica Clare Research Fellowship supports Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers, historians and writers to research and create new understandings of the past. And the fellowship is made possible by the Queensland Library Foundation. Dr Fiona Foley, internationally renowned artist and award-winning author, was the inaugural Monica Clare Research Fellow in 2020. And State Library has a proud association with Dr Foley, and many of you will have seen her extraordinary black opium installation on Level 4. And this year, she also won the top prize at the Queensland Literary Awards, the Queensland Premier's Award for Work of State Significance. Congratulations, Fiona. <laughs> Tonight, Dr Foley will present the research that she conducted as part of the fellowship which focused on the Batchelor people taken from Miraburra to Gurry, Fraser Island, by Archibald Meston. One of the outcomes of this important work is Dr Foley's latest book, Begimba's Creek Mission, the first Aboriginal experiment. Signed copies will be available for purchase in our pop-up library shop after tonight's event, and you might have seen it as you arrived tonight. Tonight we'll also have the opportunity for a short question and answer session and Sandra will do her best um, to facilitate those. So what we're going to... to <laughs> um, so what we ask you to do is log into slido.com and you'll see, I think, a barcode. Yes, the barcode there. And if you scan that with your device, that will take you in there and you can put your questions in. And slido.com is very democratic. People can vote for questions and questions move to the top. So um, Fiona will be able to take those as she... Um, Sandra, rather, will be able to take those as we go through. I'd like to now introduce Associate Professor Sandra Phillips, who will be launching Dr Foley's new book. Sandra is a member of the Waka Waka and Garang Garang Nations and Associate Dean Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland. And as I said, she's also a member of the Library Board of Queensland. So please welcome Sandra to the stage. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we have the privilege to gather this evening. I will be keeping my comments brief. And um, when I, in the body of Gavin Bannerman, approaches the stage later to lead the Q&A, um, I'm just giving you a, a tip that it won't be me sitting up here. It will be Gavin. Um, and of course, the guest um, and the main act <laughs> tonight, Dr Fiona Foley. So the two essays in the book that the prolific, incredibly hardworking um, and um, woman, artist, bachelor, advocate, activist, leader, um, Tida, sister, 
cousin, friend, uh, community member, Dr Fiona Foley, has produced, the two essays in this book, are um, quite amazing. Not only do they bring forward history as carefully researched in the collections, um, which is, as Vicky referred to, the main objective of the Monica Clare Research Fellowship, but Dr Fiona Foley presents to us challenges. This isn't a passively reshared, reinterpreted, reframed, rewritten history from the archives. I think the essay titles have clues to the challenges. Let me share them with you. The work of atonement. So there are very clear challenges in that essay for us to, to better understand our shared history and histories, but also be challenged by what it is that we now do about that. The second essay, Exploding Time, Past and Present, is further challenge in that Fiona makes direct, direct link between our shared past our, and our shared present with a view to our shared futures. So I too acknowledge, you can't walk into a room with black fellas and not go, hey, there's a... So I want to acknowledge the um, Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people I can see in Auditorium One tonight. My eyes landed on Sandra King beside her when she took her mask off. I could see Gutcha, Gutcha, Kerry Charlton, Rose Barracliffe, Olivia Robinson, of course, and um, I'm... Joanne Dreesen's a photographer whose work is here, Dr Bianca Beetson. I could go on forever. It's a bit of a blackout, in fact. And Rachel um, West, captain as well, the, the 2021 um, fellowship winner. And um, significantly for me tonight, I've got my cousin with me, Aaron Ross, which is wonderful. I too want to acknowledge Dr Louise Martin Chu in the audience tonight as Fiona Foley's, Dr Fiona Foley's biographer and friend, the work that Dr Louise Martin Chu has done in relation to um, the contribution Dr Foley ha um, provides us all has been quite phenomenal. Um, I'd also like to mention before introducing Fiona with her biography, even though you all know who she is and that's why you're here tonight, I'd like to share um, a, a comment from um, Professor Alexis Wright which Fiona's unearthing of the term charcoal opium, there's resonance here in something that Professor Wright has um, written about <clears throat> and that I too have interpreted from her work. So firstly, a quote, if you don't mind, from Professor Wright. What I try to do in my writing is to make sense of our world. What happens when you cannot crawl out of the pile at the bottom of the barrel? What happens when you are an outcast in mainstream society because you are black and you have become, for some reason or another, stigmatised and outcast in your own society? How do you cope? Professor Wright um, poses that question. Wright's bottom of the barrel analogy could suggest clearly broad comment on social hierarchy but more than that, it reminded Jackie Katona, my collaborator of mine, and I, that that analogy conjures memory of the Burketown pub and its supply of a product well known to locals as monkey blood. Now, monkey blood, blood which some of you may know, is reputed to be the dregs from barrels of red wine deemed unsuitable for sale in major centres, but profitably distributed in bladders to Aboriginal people in Burketown and that region. So charcoal opium reminds me of monkey blood, which I think the clear inference from both of those dregs that were offered up to Aboriginal peoples um, is quite apparent. So now to introducing the amazing Dr Fiona Foley. Fiona is a bachelor artist, curator, 
writer and academic. Fiona pursues a diverse artistic practice encompassing painting, printmaking, photography, sculpture, mixed media work, found objects and installation. Fiona's work examines and dismantles historical stereotypes and explores a broad range of themes that relate to politics, culture, ownership, language and identity. Fiona's artistic career spans over 30 years. Fiona's practice from the co-founding of Bamali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative in Redfern in the mid-1980s to her most recent exhibition at the QUT Art Museum called Veiled Paradise, saw some of Foley's most iconic works and some of her less seen works put into the spotlight in her first ever major survey in her home state of Queensland. As you all know, Fiona was awarded the inaugural Monica Clare Research Fellowship from the State Library of Queensland, and it's more than exciting to see Fiona's research sourced from the John Oxley Library collection in this building turned into a publication that I now have the great privilege of launching here tonight. Um, Bagimba Greek Creek Mission, the first Aboriginal experiment. Thank you. With that, I can um, say that the book is launched, Fiona. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. Oh, nice crowd here, everyone's spread out, wonderful. Um, so my talk, I get to give a little talk. Oh, there we go, first slide. Uh, is about 20 minutes long. <coughs> here we go. Oh, before I start, sorry. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge the traditional landowners for this country, the Turrbal and Yagara people. I just got carried away with myself, sorry. Um, so here we go. To speak to the contemporary nature of my art requires that I also speak to Australia's history. Making art and being commissioned to create public art for designated spaces is about engaging in a visual language. I ask myself, what do I want to communicate to a general public? This is how the suite of seven reading rooms and suspended infinity symbol of 777 poppy heads on levels four and five at the State Library of Queensland came into being. The work titled Black Opium is layered with meaning, straddling an analysis involving history, law, indigenous knowledge and creative research. It touches on all these strands. In Biting the Clouds, I make the comment, the removal of indigenous peoples off their country involved open warfare, lawlessness, was common when a township was trying to establish itself. Nationally renowned historian Henry Reynolds writes, Maraburra in Queensland's Wide Bay District experienced prolonged insecurity. Travel outside the settlement was considered dangerous for years. Colonial anxiety was high due to the level of retaliation carried out by Butchler people who at various stages of the campaign had been highly successful. They possessed inherent advantages due to their knowledge of country and its terrain. To understand the colony or colonial attitudes and race politics in Australia is to know that many overlapping layers of unjust treatments were unfolding at the same time for Indigenes. Charcoal opium is a term I came across when researching a piece of legislation titled The Aboriginal's Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act, 1897. This is when opium had already been smoked, leaving a residue ash. 
The ash was given to Aboriginal labourers in lieu of payment and to addict a people's reliance on this substance. I have used the words charcoal opium on a breastplate, a construct of the British, where this fanciful object was given to a designated Aboriginal leader of their choosing. Often engraved with a locale and name donating, donating the status such as king or queen when no such classification existed prior to English arrivals. I mimic a colonial trope by naming other realities for indigenes. I draw out these incongruities in text and imagery. Time or deep time is something I explore in the new publication, Begimba Creek Mission, the first Aboriginal experiment. I look back to my bachelor country during the 13th century when a young grey mangrove tree was taking root some 738 years ago on the muddy intertidal zone adjacent to the coursing pulse of the Mary River. I write, and that's the Magna Carta tree on the right in this image. I write, back in time, the Butchler people traversed to and from the mainland and the islands in the Great Sandy Strait with ease. What if I could be transplanted back to 13th century Australia before the madness of the colonial project took hold? What images would I discover on the old land? Stepping forward to the present, I had the opportunity this year to create a new photographic series titled The Magna Carta Tree. Various locations were selected on the mainland and Gurry for this project. The creative works and publication formed the overall project for the Monica Clare Research Fellowship. Both will play a vital role in bringing forward a bachelor voice and point of view that had not previously been present in the state archives before now. What came to light when I was going through the archives at the State Library of Queensland were subjects that circled around land use, fiscal deficits, ideology, atonement, a continuation regarding the lack of history being taught in our education institutions and the ability to make Aboriginal people and their culture invisible. A harmful ideology developed in Queensland that framed a particular pathology towards one race. That pathology involved incarceration and the criminalisation of Aboriginal sovereign nations long before any crime occurred. As early as 1874, official reports were identifying islands on the east coast of Queensland as places to relocate Aboriginals as prisoners. In 1874, Commissioner's report stated, it would scarcely be practicable to have a prison on the mainland, but there are seven, several islands off the coast which meet the requirements of isolation. The first essay in the publication is titled The Work of Atonement. Atonement means the action of making amends for a wrong or injury. The publication opens with a quote by Archibald Meston, who makes the point in 1895 that vast quantities of freehold land and leasehold land had been excised in the state from Aboriginal nations. The annual rental alone from the leased land brought in 332,000 pounds. In comparison, the state of Queensland had not expended 50,000 pounds for the benefit of Aboriginals. In fact, not one shilling had been paid for one acre of land. Maraburra was founded in 1847 by a George Ferber. The Butchler people were a nuisance to the settler society of Maraburra, forcing many to pack up and leave altogether. As a result, the town folk constantly carried their firearms and also asked the mounted native police to intervene. 
This unnamed war on the frontier lasted for 20 years against my Butchler people. The taking of our lands through force is still at the crux of what has not been dealt with today in the state of Queensland. As a director on the Butchler Aboriginal Corporation registered native title body corporate, we continue to deal with this issue involving the Department of Environment and Science and Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, some seven years after being granted consent determination over Gari by the Federal Court of Australia. How do we make sense of a history and its continuing obsfit... I knew I'd get this word wrong. Um, yeah, that's the one. That continues to govern the Butchler people without any sense of justice, compensation or atonement. This is one of the many incongruities that I raise in the publication. The trick here is to talk about the new reveals without giving too much away in this presentation as the book explores this in more depth. Archibald Meston was given authority by the state to establish his first experiment with a group of 51 Butchler people in 1897. They were relocated from Meriburra to Gurry at the behest of white Meriburra residents. Complaints were made to the Home Secretary, Horace Tozer. Tozer acted in response to the demands of the Meriburra people who no longer wanted Butchler people living in the town. Further complaints were made as the disgruntled Meriburra citizens did not want the blacks occupying the recre recreation reserve at White Cliffs near the present day Kingfisher Bay Resort. Horace Tozer obliged and the Butchler people were relocated for a second time. A new reserve was established further north at Begimba Creek. Archibald Meston, the first protector of Aboriginals in the South, was a believer in eugenics theory coming out of London. He also wanted to engage in assimilation through implementing strict work practices for Aboriginal men, yet maintain control through their isolation. His reports influenced the legislation in Queensland for decades, and in turn, helped shape policy in the Western Australian Act of 1905 and the South Australian Acts of 1910 and 1911. Both state and church were vying for Aboriginal remnant populations and their souls. There were competing interests over who would control Begimba Creek Mission and a decision was made in 1900 to take it away from Archibald Meston and give it to the Anglican Church representative, Reverend Ernest Gribble. Opium was still being issued and licenses well after the legislation had been introduced. The 1904 list of where these licenses had been issued is far reaching and is contained within the publication. I chose 1904 as it was also the year that Begimba Creek Mission was closed on Gari. Many Aboriginal people were forcibly relocated to different parts of the state of Queensland. A number of men and women were sent to Gari against their will and were fearful of the place as it had a reputation, I believe, for its cruelty. In Begimba Creek Mission, I introduced two, two new policy directions under the current state government. I tie the old with the new. They are the Tracks to Treaty Statement of Commitment and Queensland Tourism through initiatives such as the 2020 and 2021 Year of Indigenous Tourism in Queensland. The Tracks to Treaty Statement of Commitment and Implementation by the current state government speaks to thriving. Treaties and agreement making, healing and truth telling, relationships anchored by high expectations, investing in and embracing local leadership 
vibrant cultures and communities, innovative policy programs, negotiated solutions to complex challenges, guaranteed service outcomes. The difficulty is to speak about tourism on the Fraser Coast, home of the Butchler people. On the one hand, the jewel in the crown is Gari, the largest sand island in the world, with its freshwater lakes, rainforest, beaches, and wildlife. On the mainland, there are, uh, on the mainland, there are the townships of Harvey Bay and Maryborough, each with its own identity. There is a sense of a historical past when traveling to these destinations, especially coming off the highway and driving into Maryborough when you cross over the Merry River circle around the city centre to the old district towards Wharf Street, the Botanic Gardens, Post Office, the Bond Store, and the streets with the beautiful old Queenslander houses. But if you pay real, real close attention, there is something missing in a Twin Peaks kind of way. The streets today rarely, if ever, acknowledge its historical underbelly of night debauchery involving opium dens and interracial sexual proclivities or open murder of Aboriginal men on the banks of the Merry River. The old names of these people are no longer in our thoughts. Nettie, Jackie Jackie, Nosy, Boomer, Jewway, Grasson, Bobby, Ben Bullen, Jimmy, Peppo, Kula Kula, Parika, Charlie, Bungalee, Tom, Old Diamond, Peter, Toby, Tilla, Boney, Paddy, Lawley, Big Diamond, Peter with one eye, Athlone, Woolga, and Diamond, some with demeaning Europeanized nicknames upon them. Where are they in our shared history and the pavement plaques of Maryborough? What a conundrum for those who actively carry out these unspoken societal rules to keep one race out of the picture. This has all been whitewashed over in the name of empowering memory while disavowing others in an act of silencing. In the tourism stakes of Maryborough, we largely celebrate one white woman, the author of Mary Poppins' fame. Against impossible odds, how do you reclaim space when so much has been removed? In all three locations, Maryborough, Harvey Bay and Gary you will see the invisibility of the Butchler people. Sometimes we will appear on the same signage as the region's flora and fauna. This is our marker in the landscape, courtesy of some thoughtful bureaucrats. My life's mission has always been to write Butchler people back into the narrative, back into the visual landscape, and back into the history of Australia with dignity as a strong people. What happened to the Butchler people has been conveniently forgotten about, written out and not taught in Australian curriculums. This story does not come as a surprise to me any longer, but for others, it's an awakening. For instance, last week, I received a message on one of my social media platforms. She wrote, I knew things had been shocking in Queensland, but this really shone the light on the terrible truth which needs and must be told. We, as Aboriginal people, are up against a colonial mindset in this country with the proverbial knee on our necks. Gatekeeping and disavowing Aboriginal people to make decisions is acted out every day in work environments. 
I see it in institutions who profess to manage vast natural estates on behalf of the state government. I see it in higher education. And I see it in boardrooms. I read what they write in reports with recommendations, strategic plans and policy documents. The wheels of change never seem to arrive for Aboriginal sovereign nations. It's like the Shelley Bassey song. It's all just little bits of history re-repeating, and I've seen it before and I'll see it again. I gleaned these patterns of control and silencing by looking into historical legislation, the Aboriginal's Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act, 1897. However, there are a few institutions that do welcome change and openly embrace the multifaceted voices of Indigenous people into their world. The State Library of Queensland is one such place. This institution has valued my work, my intellect, and has always raised me up. As the inaugural winner of the Monica Clare Research Fellowship, I thought it only fitting that I dedicate this gem to Monica Clare herself. I would also like to thank Michael Phillips for his design of this handsome publication, who's in the audience tonight. A special acknowledgement to editor Carity Culver for pushing me to get it right. He's also here tonight. And a special thank you to Joanne Driesens, who came with me back home to country in February this year, who worked on this particular project. And six of her images are contained within the publication, and she's here tonight as well. I paid tribute to the staff at the State Library of Queensland for their ongoing support of my work over many years. You are an exemplar by including Aboriginal voices innovatively through presenting new realities, new narratives, and for taking creative risks. Thank you. That's, I know why you wanted to sit on that side, because the colour of the book and your <laughs> dress, are, they, they match perfectly. Um, so if anybody is um, on the technology, uh, there's the Slido link where feel free to type in any questions and put those through. Um, in a COVID environment, unfortunately, you couldn't get a better way to transmit a virus than handing a microphone round to, to multiple people. So in the interest of public health, we're, we're going online only um, and uh, hopefully delve into your research a little bit yep. more, yep. Fiona. You've been speaking for 20 minutes, so um, take your time. Um, thank you so much for your research and those generous words. I think, as I speak for everybody, there's such an um, excitement about the publication, the work that you've done, and just a gratitude for... It's been a big year for you, so um, thank you for all your work in bringing these stories to light. One thing I wanted to start with, and I was really struck with in reading the book, was, and in an earlier presentation you gave at the State Library, was it was just around details and noticing, which you were talking a bit about, um, the, the noticing of the absence of... Aboriginal presence in the Meribah region. But I think it's um, shocking to a degree, you know, you, you hear about the you know, Protection Act and sale of opium and that sort of thing, but it, it sort of is so revealing about the charcoal opium issue. I, I, for me, that was new information. I didn't quite comprehend. I just, you know, very basically thought it was, you know, you smoke it, you know, do, do what you do. But um, the, the fact that it was the dregs of the ash turned into a drink and drunk by people, it was something in that 
detail and the revelation of that detail through your research that um, really confronted me and but just made me realise that it sort of cut through a lot of stuff, that, that, that level of detail that this is, this is what we're talking about. I, I suppose, was that an important thing for you? All of it's important. Uh, you know, um, some people who are here tonight, um, my ex-supervisor from Griffith University, Ross Woodrow, um, you know, it's all been a journey. And so I've been encouraged when I was writing the PhD to sort of really delve into um, the complexities of race relations in the state of Queensland. And for me, it was principally three races, Europeans, Chinese and Aboriginal people. And they were partaking in opium in very um, different ways based on their race, r racial origin. So not many people would be aware that opium was legal in the state up until 1897 when the legislation came in. So um, the state government had control over how they were di distributing it through licences right across the state. Many people were partaking in it, but they were using it in different ways. So um, I understand that Europeans and Chinese were uh, smoking opium and were a part of like opium dens whereas Aboriginal people were being given the opium ash where the opium had already been smoked and it was a form of payment and that was being given to Aboriginal men, women and children because there were labour shortages in the state of Queensland at that during the gold rush era and um, there were white people weren't working on properties or they weren't working in the um, pearling industry. They were off trying to find their own riches. So there are many layers and many complexities to the legislation, the use of opium and how it was, um, you know, distributed. Like so, in, so for instance, in Maryborough, when I talk about that 1904 list of who was receiving opium still legally, it was, it was illegal, but who was still being issued from the state government. There were three opium dens in Maryborough, and this is the history that we don't talk about. It's been silenced. We don't educate young people about the devastating effect this legislation had on Aboriginal populations and how it was used as a Trojan horse to get into Aboriginal communities and move Aboriginal men, women and children off their traditional lands to other locations. So it's a long-winded answer, but Archibald Meston was one of those architects of removing people from central Queensland uh, to an island environment that would have been totally um, foreign to people coming from out west. And, the, you know, the fear, the psychological fear of going to an island not knowing what was there, the harsh treatment that could be inflicted. And also I talk about in the book um, diseases that were happening on the island, which is hookworm infestation, was rife. Um, as part of doing this project, you've been required to go through, you know, that primary source material, the photographs, um, that, that sort of material, you know, that, that, and that photograph is so powerful with, you know, the group of people sitting in front of that house, and, you know. Um, uh, what was it like for you looking through that material? You, you know, th these are all created by non-Indigenous people um, with that, that perspective, but what are you looking for and what is your experience of going through these colonial archives? I'm looking for the original voice, the butchler voice, and it's absent from the equation. So when do we get to be framed in the historical picture? So that's why it's, you know, and growing up in Harvey Bay, being born in Maryborough because it was the only hospital when I, that was there when I was born. Um, like, my mother didn't have the luxury of being born in the hospital. My mother was born just to historically tell you that, you know, I was born in Maryborough Hospital. My mother was born in a humpy and limper street, Urangan. 
um, and all of the, her siblings were born at home in a humpy. That's the, you know, how rapid generations change. So, you know, I've been afforded a, an education through uh, receiving a PhD, um, but that was always my mother's emphasis that you had to be educated to be successful in the world. And um, so I look at, you know, younger generations of bachelor people coming through the ranks today, and what is important for me is that our voice has to be in the narrative somewhere. We have to articulate this in many different ways. So I articulate our presence in making art, I articulate it through writing for Griffith Review, I articul articulate it through putting out my own publication or biting the clouds with UQP. And the work is never ending because it's backtracking a historic history that has written you out for decades and decades and decades. So I remember growing up asking my mother a lot of questions about Begimba Creek Mission. And, you know, you'd get a hint of something, but it was like there was never like a linear um, thread that pieced it all together. So that's why it was so important to write Biting the Clouds, where there was much more of the jigsaw puzzle that I could present in the narrative. Um, and other people will do other types of research. So Rose Barrowcliffe is in the audience tonight. She's doing other sorts of research that's different to my research, and all of those are valid voices, valid bachelor voices in the mix. And, you know, the work is continual, it's ongoing, and it's, it's never-ending because, as um, another colleague likes to talk about, state violence, you know, we are still undergoing state violence in this country, in this state, as Aboriginal people. And I see that perpetrated through departments like Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service when we try to, you know, for bachelor people, it's near impossible for us to light a fire on Fraser Island. And thanks to those four young white lads last year, it's probably off the radar. You know, they set Gari alight half of the island alight. Do you think these are issues which you've been publicly talking about for a long time now? Do you think that people are starting, that audiences' uh, receptiveness to, to this message is people are more open to it? Yeah, definitely. I've seen a change, let's say, in the last 10 years. And I've you know, I go to um, the Brisbane Writers' Festival that's held here. I see a, a new type of receptiveness of people who are interested in reading all sorts of um, understandings about Aboriginal culture, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. And there's a real appetite and a curiosity to know more. And I think that's really, really encouraging. It, talking about um, the voices and the different voices, uh, the two the two essays in in the publication are they're written in a really different way, and the tone is is really different. Did you want to talk about the different approach of the the two essays? Oh, I'm too close. So I, <laughs> I don't really. That's just that's just me. Um, so there's you know there's two big things that are coming out. Um, in terms of the state and the direction that they're moving in. So I wanted to pick up on two key things, which is tourism, Indigenous tourism, and the Tracks to Treaty um, document. And, you know, how are we going to unpack these two? So the white paper for tourism, Indigenous tour tourism, is being um, presented this month on the 10th. And... Um, Tracks to Treaty is a four-page document that you can access online. How, does, how do we um, turn Aboriginal nations around so that they are also partaking in the economic uh, development and um, accessing 
um, capital through tourism that's happening on Gari. Mm. So when I was first a director after the consent determination for Gari in 2014, I spent a year and a half as a director and I remember our first meeting with uh, middle management from Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service and I put it to them after having done a little bit of research about the Uluru Katajuta um, National Park and how every uh, vehicle that accesses the park, there is a portion of that um, permit that they um, are allowed to have entry where it goes back to the traditional landowners. And I thought we should implement the same thing here on Gari because the vehicle access, access permits um, captures pretty much every, every tourist that comes to the island. And I thought back in the day that we could put a $5 levy um, on the vehicle permit, and that hasn't eventuated. But at that particular meeting, all, those three men laughed at me as if I was a silly Aboriginal woman. And so now the fee's gone up to $10. Um, I'm on the, yeah, but trying to get the money out of the state government is near impossible. So that's why I make mention, seven years after the federal court has made their decision, and I don't think people who go to Gari would be begrudging of $10. It's because we are the most economically disadvantaged group in the Fraser Coast area. But we see all of those tourist visitors, their dollars um, going somewhere and the Butchler people are not able to access any of it. And the other big thing in relation to that is when I went to Tampa, Florida to do a project in 2001, I went to a reservation in um, the city of um, Tampa and worked with Seminole people. And unbeknownst to me that um, on the one side they had the casino and on the other side they had the wildlife park with snapping turtles and alligators. And when the Seminole young man took us into the casino, I said to him, so where is the reservation? So he looked at me a little bit dumbfounded because we were standing on the reservation. And so um, some years later, in 2006, I read that the Seminole people had bought all the hard rock cafes around the world. And I thought, these people are really business astute. So I think Aboriginal people are business astute too. And it, but the problem here is that the state government makes us reliant upon them, so we don't have any economic independence. And that's why the $10 levy is so important, because bachelor people would have a capital each year which would be economically independent from the state government. We could run projects ourselves and our own uh, culture um, ventures that we wanted. So, that's the type of level I'm thinking about, you know, and it's just like always going cap in hand to the state government, where they devise the rules. They, and so now they're telling us this week as a director, they're telling us how we can spend the money from the um, vehicle permits. And that's how patronising they are. So that must mean something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in undergoing your research and, and doing the work that you do, you know, you're uh, also investigating your own story and your own history. Um, there's a question here which I think is a pertinent one to, to people doing research like this. How do you, um, how do you manage self-care? What's your approach to keep going? Self-care? Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I have a boxing trainer. I ha see him twice a week. <laughs> and early Sunday mornings I do tennis with the trainer. That's what I secretly enjoy. 
And you talk about being in the book. You talk about being by yourself a lot, and mm. in either in country or or in a specific place. Do do you get a time to do that? To do what? Be by yourself all the time. <laughs> <laughs> No, I like my. I like. This sounds a bit sad. I like my own company. I like. Um, I love solitude. I love being in the bush. So I have a house back home in Harvey Bay. It's on half an acre of land. And when I bought that block of land, I made sure I kept some a stand of the original trees, where everyone else in my street, it's, the street's called Blue Water Road, everyone else in my street bulldozed all the native, you know, trees. So they look. They look barren, half-acre blocks, but then they do this thing of um, planting palm trees. <laughs> and I can't stand it. I hate palm trees. <laughs> and so, and the joy of having this natural little bit of bush on this block of land is that I get to see things like um, tawny frogmouth owls, and they nest there each year. And, you know, other different types of wildlife come through that half-acre block of land. Sometimes there's snakes, but, the, oh, you know, I get frilly-necked lizards. And so nature is really, really important to me. And um, physical exercise is important because it also helps with your mental health. So that's, you know, every week I'll do something physical. And just probably continuing on that, um, I, I note that it was quite meaningful to you being the first Monica Clare um, Research Fellow and that you dedicate, you know, in your um, introduction the, to, to her. I suppose, did you want to talk a little bit about that kind of connection and congratulations on being the first fellow, what that means to you, that connection and, and forging that path? Well, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that I didn't know who Monica Clare was when I entered into the competition, um, the fellowship. So, And then when I won the Monica Clare Research Fellowship, I thought it was important that I found out who this woman is. So I um, went on to do a Google search and on eBay, I tracked down her publication, which was, she was, it's um, known as the first Aboriginal person to author um, a, a, a publication. And so I read the book cover to cover. I wanted to find out who she was. She had a strong background in the union uh, movement in New South Wales, and she would travel with her husband who was non-Indigenous to various places in New South Wales and be a part of the union movement. And when she would travel with him, it was an opportunity for her to talk to Aboriginal people and talk to them about their living conditions and how harsh you know, treatment that they were receiving and, and help improve um, living conditions for Aboriginal people in that state. So I thought she was an interesting woman and... Um, I do know something about her now, so that was a part of winning the award, was um, understanding her life and dedicating this book to her. And I was a part of a panel that selected the second person who received the Monica Clare Fellowship, and I met her earlier tonight. She's in the audience <laughs> somewhere here. And this uh, tradition, and she's in the third <laughs> row. It's Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, this tradition will continue, and I just think it's wonderful opportunity for our histories to be told. And Rachel will do a fantastic job in relation to her particular history. Is it from Charles Towers? Charleville? Charleville. Uh, there you go. <laughs> totally got that wrong. <laughs> So um, I just think it's a wonderful opportunity for Indigenous people who are interested in mining the archives here at the State Library, finding out information and um, having the opportunity to turn it into something else, like the possibility of a film Rachel was talking about, 
or for, in my case, the opportunity to turn that research into a, a, a little publication. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you for all these questions coming through. It's great to see that. Um, I was just going to ask, um, last question, what next for, for you, Fiona? What's the next research topic? I've had the opportunity to be invited um, to be a part of a two-day symposium that's coming out of the University of Alberta in Canada, Edmonton, Canada. And uh, um, it, the conference symposium is about climate resilience. And I get to give a paper on the 2020 fires more broadly in Australia, but also I get to talk about the wildfire that happened on Gari um, last year over a two month period. And I get to talk about our Prime Minister and his holiday in Hawaii. And I get to talk about the climate change um, direction Australia's going in after the talks in Glasgow. And I get to talk about um, Indigenous uh, fire management, where we have successfully managed this country for 65,000 years and talk about um, the system that we had in place, which are, are cool burns as opposed to hot burns, which is the wildfires that happen here nearly every summer. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions. Thank you so much for all your questions. Um, we might not have an opportunity to answer them all, but you will have an opportunity to ask them to Fiona in person. Um, we have copies of the new publication along with your other publications um, for sale and you pick up a signed copy outside um, the doors um, when we finish up. I also just wanted to um, mention to people that the Monica Clare Fellowship, which we just discussed, um, we're looking for funding. Um, this is currently supported through the Queensland Library Foundation at the moment, but is currently unfunded, along with um, a new fellowship, an LGBTIQ plus research fellowship, the Rainbow Fellowship, which we're looking for support for. Um, these are important initiatives that will have significant impact in the community. If you'd like to talk about any of these um, funding opportunities, please contact myself or Vicky McDonald or anybody with a name tag or a black State Library shirt. Um, and we'd be happy to talk further about that. Um, the research will keep going and we, there is a strong commitment to that, but we're always happy to talk to people who are willing to um, assist us in that mission. Uh, I wanted to just... Um, that's probably the conclusion of the formalities for, for tonight. I want to thank everybody for their contributions through the questions, through your attendance, through your enthusiasm. But most of all, I'd like to thank Fiona for just being amazing. Thanks, Gavin. Yeah.